Hi everybody, welcome to the water cycle video number three. This is water in the sky and traditionally this has been part of the module that people have found a little bit tricky. So this might be a video that you <laughs> pause, rewind, watch a few times. Um, if I don't explain it in a way that works for you, please, please don't be embarrassed to say to your teacher, I need more help on this because um, we can keep trying to find alternative ways to, to try and explain this to you. Okay, don't be embarrassed. This is traditionally quite tricky. There should be a section in your module booklet called Water in the Sky. And just to remind you where this fits in, we've learned the water cycle, but we kind of, we talk about these outputs. So we've got evapotranspiration, we've got evaporation. We're kind of ignoring rivers for today. So we're just gonna talk about two of the three, evaporation, evapotranspiration. And they give us water vapor in the atmosphere. And then we talk about precipitation that falls out of the sky. And what we haven't done yet is to kind of joined those two things together and said, well, why does water fall back out of the sky again? What, what happens between the evaporation and the evapotranspiration and the precipitation? So this is the lesson that joins those two bits of the water cycle together. We need to just start with something hopefully quite familiar, nothing too tricky. We need to start with the fact that water can occur in three states, solid, liquid, gas, and those three states are entirely controlled by temperature. I wouldn't have thought this was news to you, but I do think it's an important starting point for us. Now, the thing that might be new information to you is that when water changes state, so when it changes from being a solid, liquid or a gas, it can either need heat, require heat, use heat, or it can produce it. Now, again, I'm going to refer back to body temperature here because that's quite helpful. One of the things that happens if your body gets too hot is that you sweat. So your body very deliberately releases liquid out of your skin and it gets evaporated. So we're dealing with this. We get liquid coming out of your skin that gets evaporated. And the significance of sweating, look, is it requires heat to do that. It therefore takes heat out of your body to cool you down. Brilliant, genius solution, isn't it? Okay. Whereas, look, when water goes the other way, it produces heat. Now this is something I will refer back to later, but it's just worth making a you know teeny tiny note of, okay? Um, partly, this kind of would be a, an example of feedback for you that we talked about in video number two, um, but partly this explains, this bit uh, explains something that's gonna come up in this video, okay? Right. We know this, water gets into the sky due to evaporation or evapotranspiration. The only difference between those two processes is that one of them is any other surface except plants, evaporation, and evapotranspiration is evaporation from plants. It's the only reason we've got two words to try and differentiate those things. So that's how the water gets into the sky. Okay, evaporation, evapotranspiration. And at this point, it is a vapour, so it's a gas. And water vapour is invisible. It will be all around you. Um, in fact, as I'm talking right now, loads and loads of water vapour will be coming out of my mouth because humans are, I think, about 70% water. And as I'm talking to you, there will be water vapour coming out of my mouth. We can't see it because it's a gas. If it was a really cold day, like in the middle of the winter, and I was walking outside, you probably would be able to see the water vapour because um, on a really cold day, you can see people's breath. It appears as this kind of white cloud kind of thing. And that actually is all due to this. On a really, really cold day, when you breathe out, um, the water vapour is turning into little tiny droplets of liquid in the air, which you can then see. But anyway, there's water vapour all around you, you just can't see it. 
okay? And it's in the air thanks to these two uh, outputs. So, stage one. Air rises for three reasons. You should find you've got a version of these diagrams in your module booklet, but I'm going to talk you through them. This is important. It comes up in year one and year two, so it is worth having a couple of uh, attempts at. Right. This one is called relief, R-E-L-I-E-F. Is that the right spelling or is it E-I-F? Not sure now. <laughs> You're going to have to check that, sorry. Relief or orographic. Orographic is quite old fashioned, but anyway. What is happening here? Well, we've got a hill or a mountain. So as the wind blows, it's got no choice. It's got to go up over that hill or that mountain. And as it rises, it's going to cool down. I'll come back to the rest of it. This is something that doesn't happen very often in the UK. Look, there's the big bright yellow thing in the sky called the sun. <laughs> we do occasionally have hot days in the UK, but this is much more common near the equator. So the sun heats the earth, hot air rises. Think about hot air balloons, okay? If hot air didn't rise, a hot air balloon ride is pretty boring, isn't it? Because you're just going to sit in a basket in a field. That's going to be rubbish. So this is called convection, okay? And it's because of heat from the sun. The air rises and it cools. Here, this is a bit of a weird one, but it actually explains why it rains in the UK. We have warm air and cold air meeting. This might be the point where some of you start to get a bit confused. Cold air is much denser and heavier than warm air. So if you think of warm air being like oil and cold air being like water, if you put oil and water into a cup, the oil floats because it's less dense. Well, in the same way, the warm air goes up and the cold air stays at the bottom just because they have a different density. The warm air rises and it cools down. So what I need you to realise is that the reason that the air rises is different. It rises because it's forced over a hill or a mountain. It rises because it's hot. It rises because it meets cold air. Okay? The reason that the air rises is different. But the end result is exactly the same. Air rises and it cools down. And when air cools down, it will change state. So instead of being a gas, it's going to either turn into a liquid or a solid, depending on the temperature. And that, ladies and gents, is called condensing. Okay, condensation, condensing, whatever. You may have seen this in a car on a, on a cold day um, because as we've talked about the fact that you will breathe out lots of uh, water vapour, if the windows of the car are very, very cold, as you breathe out, the windows fog up, they get very steamy and that steam is the water vapour from everybody's breath instantly touching the cold windows and condensing, turning into a liquid, or if it was a seriously cold day, a solid. But I would like to think nobody has a car that cold. So the air rises for three different reasons, but the end result is that it cools down, the water vapour condenses, and it either becomes a liquid, which is droplets of water, or it becomes a solid, which would be an ice crystal or a snowflake. And that, ladies and gents, is where your clouds come from. Okay, now you might need to listen to that again. You might need to do a bit of internet searching. But that's the first important thing. The fact that air rises for three different reasons, but the end result is the same. The end result is a cloud, okay? Water vapour cools, condenses, and it turns into liquid or solid which is all a cloud is. It's just a collection of water. Okay. This video is quite scientific. Um, it's brilliant, but it is quite scientific. So if you're not quite ready for, for it yet, 
maybe hold off. Um, but at some point when you're feeling brave, <laughs> it does sort of link uh, the various things I've been trying to explain to you and uh, some of the, the previous things. So it's, it is good. But we've now got clouds in the sky. I have good news for you. Unfortunately, you don't need to know all those different names. I say unfortunately because I am a fully paid up cloud geek to the extent that I'm actually a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Yes, there is such a thing. Um, and I wish everyone was a cloud geek, but I accept that they're not. So at the moment, you just need to know that there are clouds. Clouds are collections of water droplets or uh, ice crystals or snowflakes. They are part of the water cycle, okay? Now, we classify clouds uh, in a couple of different ways. The only way I need you to know for today is that we classify clouds by temperature. So a warm cloud, If sorry to keep clicking, but I just want to remind you, a warm cloud is where every particle of water in that cloud is a liquid, so it's above zero, and a cold cloud is where it's below zero, and some of the... Um, water has frozen. Usually at this point somebody will go, well hang on a minute Nikki, if it's below zero degrees, why the hell is there some liquid water? Like why hasn't it all frozen? Well if you filled an ice cube tray with water, chucked it in the freezer and pulled it out half an hour later, some of the water would have frozen and some of it wouldn't. It's exactly the same principle. That water would have cooled, it just hasn't quite got round to doing it yet. Okay, that's all it is. It's just a timing issue. So we've got our clouds, which are collections of water, and all we're caring about at the moment is whether they're warm or cold. This is information you don't particularly need. Then, here comes the, the bit where I might start to lose some of you. We've got our clouds in the sky. Why do they then give precipitation? What is it that makes a cloud snow or rain? Or why does that water vapour fall out of the sky again? And again, we're back to three different reasons. So we've got three reasons that air rises and gives you clouds in the first place. And we've now got three reasons that precipitation will fall out the sky. I'm going to show you some as per usual, horrific diagrams that I've attempted, because that's all I'm capable of. And we're going to look at warm clouds, we're going to look at cold clouds, and we're going to look at something called condensation nuclei. Okay, now, as ever, I'm going to do my best to explain, but you will find lots of videos and websites attempting to explain this to you at other places on the internet. So if my version doesn't work for you, I will not be in the slightest bit offended if you need to go off and look at something else. But that, these are the three things that you need to know. Okay, I did tell you they were pretty horrific diagrams, didn't I? Right, I would draw these. I would obviously encourage you to do better versions <laughs> than I've managed. This is a warm cloud, and I wish I'd drawn a few more droplets in it, but there we are. This is a warm cloud, so all of the water is liquid. Okay, and we're just gonna talk about this. And the phrase that you need to remember for a warm cloud is collision and coalescence. Collision means to hit something. It's what the police, uh, use, the terminology the police use for a, an accident on the road is an RTC, a road traffic collision. It's, it's bumping into something. Coalescence means to join together. So what happens in a warm cloud, remembering of course that the droplets are droplets, this is liquid water, in that cloud these droplets are going to move around, they're going to bump into each other which is where the collision comes from. When they bump into each other they're going to join together and therefore very gradually your droplets are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, they're going to bump into each other, they're going to join together and very gradually those droplets are going to get bigger and bigger until they are big enough to be affected by gravity 
and they will fall out the sky. Because at this moment, they're so microscopically tiny that gravity doesn't affect them. When they knocked into each other and joined together, they're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until they fall out the sky as a raindrop. That's why warm clouds rain. Ta-da! Right, Bergeron Findison. This is the simplest way I can possibly explain the Bergeron Findison process. And as I said to you, you can, in fact, like Google this, do a lot of research um, because it can be way more complicated that I'm about to, to do. But I can promise you that the version I am about to explain to you will get you through the A-level, okay? <laughs> so don't worry. This is a cold cloud. So we've got some frozen particles, some solid, and we've got some liquid droplets. Okay, simple version. The liquid water is attracted to the frozen water. Okay, so these droplets are attracted to the snow and the ice and then the snow and ice crystals get bigger because as soon as that droplet hits the frozen particle it freezes instantly and so your frozen particle gets bigger until, guess what, it's big enough to be affected by gravity and it will fall out the sky. Cool, huh? Now here's the weird thing, pretty much all of the precipitation that falls in the UK happens in this way which might make you go, well, hang on a minute, you're telling me that snow falls out of the sky, but it doesn't snow very often in the UK. Well, true. What happens is that up at the altitude that this cloud is, uh, these are snowflakes or ice crystals. But generally, as they fall through the atmosphere, it warms up and they melt. And therefore, by the time that snow or ice crystal has reached the surface of the Earth, it's a raindrop. And if you love snow, I'm really sorry because that's really disappointing, isn't it? But most of the precipitation that falls in the UK will have started out as snow, but it melts on its way down. And the only thing that's different on the days where it does actually snow is that the atmosphere that it falls through is cold enough that it doesn't melt. That's all that needs to change. Weird, huh? Uh, just a quick note here, if you've heard people say it's too cold to snow, that is an absolute myth. It makes no sense at all, um, because otherwise why does it snow in Antarctica? Um, so please ignore that myth, it, it yeah, doesn't work. Finally, so that's your warm cloud, that's your cold cloud. What the hell are these? I've not mentioned these. These red blobs are blobs of pollution. Now. They could be soot particles, they could be um, bits of um, an ash cloud from a volcanic eruption, they could come out of a car exhaust, but they are microscopic little particles that are hanging around in the air. So if you draw a cloud that kind of looks like it's got chicken pox, you've basically got the right idea. So when you dissect their name, they do actually tell you pretty much everything you need to know. These water droplets are attracted to the little bits of pollution and they condense around them. So you get condensation because of the process of condensing and then that little red blob ends up in the middle like a nucleus. So that's why they're called that. And the more this happens, the larger the uh, droplet will become until, hopefully this is getting quite familiar now, it will be affected by gravity and it will fall out the sky. But here's my favourite thing about condensation nuclei. This is the way that the air cleans itself. Because once that little blob of whatever has become the middle of a raindrop, and fallen out of the sky, it's not in the air anymore. So this is a way that the air kind of cleans itself, which is brilliant. And if you have ever been in a big city, and by which I don't mean Taunton or Exeter, I mean like a properly big city, if you have been there before and after it rains, the air does actually smell fresher, it does actually smell different, and it's because the air is actually cleaner after it rains because it gets rid of it. And the truth of the matter is, um, 
it's probably true to say that there is an element of this in most parts of the world now because we've got so much pollution globally this probably is part of the reason for precipitation in most places okay so warm clouds cold clouds polluted clouds just a um, couple of little diagrams to help you get a sense of scale this is why we call them condensation nuclei because they end up in the middle of a rain droplet but in terms of scale this is the tip top <laughs> i love that phrasing of a typical raindrop a typical raindrop ladies and gents is two millimeters in diameter so that might oops that might give you a sense of how enormous uh, that raindrop is compared look to the other things condensation nuclei are microscopic in fact we breathe them in without realizing okay they're that tiny cloud droplets are very small and that's why they're not affected by gravity and then as you get your co collision and coalescence or your condensation nuclei gradually your cloud droplets get bigger but generally they will only fall out of the sky once you get to um, about two mils you don't need to remember that figure but i'm just telling you okay if you're with me so far you've done really well um, the easy end to this lesson is uh, to know the different names for types of precipitation which you will find in your module booklet but you will also find some videos uh, on YouTube. Uh, the top one is from the Met Office so it's obviously uh, really good because they know about weather that's kind of their job and the second one is from an american news channel and what i really like about it is uh, they've got this really cool kind of like 3d graphics to try and explain to you um, why you get different types of precipitation which is quite cool so it's worth knowing what the different types of precipitation are and kind of being able to recognize them don't spend hours on this but you know maybe knowing the difference between rain sleet that kind of thing would be quite good and there is um, a little graphic. I'm going to whiz through this, but you can pause and take some notes if you want to. Hail is a rather sort of different kind of a thing. This chap on the left was a cyclist who was in a race and got stuck in a hailstorm. And you can see the damage that the hail has done to his body. And on the right, you can see the damage that hail does to cars. Hail is not something we need to, to know very much about, but it is solid balls of ice and um, the Met Office uh, video explains hail to you really, really well. Don't please, as I said a minute ago, don't spend hours on it, but hail's probably one of the more interesting types of precipitation. So the finale of this water in the sky is um, linking precipitation to flooding because we do have intense amounts of precipitation sometimes. And what I've given you um, in the module booklet and in front of you, so you've got the UK records and you've got the global records. I mean, it's it's mad, really. So look, highest, highest average annual total. This is a, a place we'll look at in year two, actually. So that is nearly 12 metres depth of rain a year. That's bonkers, isn't it? The more precipitation you get out the sky, particularly if you get it in intensive bursts or for a long period of time, the more likely you are to have a flood. So I've just included some uh, little videos here um, that you could link. It's worth just having a little name drop um, of precipitation leading to flooding, not oodles of detail. That, um, flash flood video footage is really good. Australia 2021 is uh, quite notable. Uh, mostly, it caught my attention because of this link here. Um, spiders, snakes and alligators were also affected by flooding in Australia and with some pretty scary consequences in my opinion. Um, so they're just quite interesting floods because Yes, floods in the UK are dangerous, but we don't have to worry about alligator-infested flood water, do we? Thank goodness. 
Um, Boss Castle is just a really famous flood um, from Cornwall where intense rainfall led to um, a crazy flood. Nobody died, thank goodness, but it was a crazy flood. And the case study that we go on and on about in uh, geography is the Somerset levels, partly because they're on our doorstep, obviously, and partly because uh, they're quite notable for a number of reasons. So just um, a, a few notes on precipitation leading to flooding. And that is just some revision questions for you. If you can do those things, fab, you've got it. If you can't, you either need to go back and watch the video again, do a bit of internet searching or talk to your teacher. Okay, well done, ladies and gents. That was, that was quite intense.